Welcome to the Mixed Media Tapes. The Mixed Media Tapes is a short artist talk series based on word and phrase prompts. I have invited visual artists to select prompts from a list and to share their thoughts and stories based on those prompts. In this recording, Jonathan Christie talks about music and freedom and their influence on his artistic process. Hi, uh, my name is Jonathan Christie. And it's nice to chat with you, Philip. Thanks for uh, inviting me. Uh, so that I enjoy your interviews. Anyway, I'm Jonathan Christie, and I'm a painter, and uh, I live in Sydney, Australia. I've uh, studied my, my artistic history goes back to um, when I studied, you know, 20 or 30 years ago. Um, in this area, really, uh, Wollongong, which is just south of Sydney. So basically, I've all, my artistic life has always been in this area. Um, Sydney's not huge compared to, say, east coast of America, but there's quite a good uh, art world here, small but good. I put down music and freedom, um, which might sound a, a little bit strange or philosophical, but that's me. I'm... Uh, quite philosophical in my approaches. I did a degree uh, not that long ago in uh, at, at the University of Sydney, uh, and I did a double major in philosophy and art history theory. Um, so the, the philosophy that I've done there, uh, I've found it's quite important to me. I'll talk a bit more about that. Uh, but music, I, I think I'll tackle the music first, if you like. Um, okay, when I was um, in my uh, late teens, I guess, um, I didn't know much about music. My, my father had listened to classical music, but my parents were separated. But um, someone gave me a guitar, and that led me to go to the local library. And largely by chance, I came across the music of um, J.S. Bach, the um, Baroque composer. And um, I don't know what it is, but I, I think there's a f physiological thing, uh, the way your brain works, but as soon as I heard that particular composer, something just went click um, in my head, uh, and I've never lost that affinity with his music. Um, I mean, there are other composers and uh, genres that I love. Um, for instance, uh, I, I love jazz. I don't know it that well, but I really respect it. But the music of Bach, for some reason, um, and I know other people say this, it's um, th there's something about it, and I, I, I honestly think it's the way my, my brain works or my mind works. I don't know that that's true for other people, um, but what's that got to do with painting? Um, when I listen to Bach, and it's always been this case, it's been a very structural uh, experience for me. It's like... Um, walking through spaces in, in rooms. It's like the size of rooms. It's not a physical image, but it feels like that. Um, other people have said that as well. It's it's sort of very sculptural in a way. Um, when I was at art college, I didn't study sculpture. I'm not a sculptor at all, uh, but I've um, come up against some excellent uh, sculptors and have, have kept in contact with them. In fact, some of my old teachers uh, had an exhibition opening just a few weeks ago, and I went along to that. Uh, so I've, I've been in close contact with them. Uh, and, for instance, one of them was a uh, pupil of Anthony Caro. He is an English sculptor. Uh, in the, say, early 60s, he was uh, really the first one to take industrial pieces of steel iron girders and that sort of thing and off cuts of steel that are sort of squashed and he uh, puts them together uh, quite amazing he's, he's, he's died uh, last year I think uh, he's, he's great uh, great sculptor but there's the strength of the steel but also the negative spaces are really important um and, uh, well, that, that's something that's always been important to me, negative space. Um, when you listen to Bach, uh, it's the space between the notes as much as the notes themselves. I should explain Bach's music 
is contrapuntal. I don't know if uh, everyone's familiar with that term, but it basically means that you've got different melodies playing against each other. Uh, if you think of a simple round like Frere Jaffa or Row, 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 Your Boat, uh, you, someone sings it and then someone starts singing it uh, later or and, and three times or even four times, and you have these three or four different voices uh, working together but each can be doing something quite different. So there's a sense of the space and the, the constant uh, relationships uh, shifting between between the phrases and the music. Now, when I paint, I should start talking about my painting, I guess. <laughs> I, I've been um, doing, uh, for the last uh, couple of years, I've been doing uh, very simple structural shapes in my work. Uh, lines, rectangles, everything's got a straight, neat edge or a, a, a neat, curved edge. Uh, but I find that um, when you start a drawing or a painting, uh, you put down a mark and then it's no longer just a blank surface, but a mark with a space around it. It's like if you play a note, uh, then there's silence around it. Then you choose where does the next mark go. So then you've got two two uh two objects or two shapes or two spaces but there's really three there's the space between them as well as the two things so you've got a triangle and a circle for argument's sake it's not just those two objects but there, there's a space between and around them and they actually create their own space um and the the music of Bach is very much like that. Often his music just starts with a single note or a single short tune and then it's added by another short tune and it builds up that way. Um, so I guess that's not a very common <laughs> common way that um, artists would talk about a primary influence, but to be honest, I think that's uh, probably more than anywhere uh, where I've learned about drawing and composition uh, as much as anywhere else, at least. Certainly a lot of uh, visual artists, I'd be a complete liar and uh, wouldn't want to say that they haven't influenced me <laughs> as an art student and hopefully continuing on. Uh, the, you, you have a curiosity and you, you absorb, you absorb, you absorb, and, you know, it sort of goes through. Um, I keep mentioning art school because I think when you leave art school, you haven't learned to be an artist, but you learn how to learn. That's the best you can hope out of that. The other thing I was going to mention with the music, which fascinates me, uh, is this uh, physiological uh, phenomenon called, um, oh, the words just slipped, uh, where, where some people can hear a sound, but they see colours, um, synesthesia. Yeah, scientists, I don't fully understand it, but scientists think that there, you know, there are different parts of the brain that deal with different things, colour, sound, motion, outline, uh, form, etc. Uh, and um, there's a sort of overlap or an intercommunication going on between different parts of the brain, which is slightly unusual. Uh, and so some people, when they hear a sound, Messier, he heard sounds, but he saw colours. He, he actually saw colours. Uh, and there are other strange ones too, like some people see road signs and have tastes in their mind. <laughs> it's, it's not an imagined thing, it's real. Uh, and I don't claim that I've got synesthesia, although some scientists say that everyone's got it in some degree. But I sort of, uh, I wish I did, but uh, when I hear music, it's like I'm... To a degree, I'm hearing form, uh, a sort of visual form, not specifically, but I get a feeling of that. Uh, and I think that's that's a major part of why uh, these particular types of music have been an influence on me. Doing art is a being, it's a living, it's an exploration, it's a journey, it's not an end. Uh, you know, we, we create these artefacts uh, called art pieces, um, but for, for an artist, they're almost like byproducts that, that sort of, as you're, you're going along, I guess you're in a rowboat and as you, you um, put the oars in the water, these ripples travel out and they're the artifacts. But it's the, the onward going, uh, except in this journey on the boat, there's no particular end in mind. It's the, the journey that matters. <laughs> In 
In this next portion, Jonathan Christie talks about freedom and its influence on his art process. I just thought that might make a segue too uh, into the second prompt, if you like. Yeah, sure, the freedom, yeah. Yeah, freedom. Why did I uh, mention freedom? Um, to be honest, uh, when you're asking for the prompts, I, I, I nominated them. I'd been that day to a, an exhibition that made me think about very specific uh, philosophical concepts with freedom. It's a, it's a little bit quirky, but I think it also um, represents typically the way I tend to think. Um, uh, obviously, I, I tend to be quite philosophical in my approach, which isn't true of all artists, and that's fine. It's just the way my brain works, I think. Anyway, I, I was at an exhibition in Sydney, um, and there are two... Uh, fairly recently deceased artists, Australian artists who are quite well respected. You probably haven't heard of them. One is James Gleeson, who was a, a surrealist. Uh, and the other is a chap, or was a chap called uh, Ken Wisson, uh, who, who sort of went into pop art, but uh, a lot of his drawings are the type of drawings where you play freely with lines, abstract lines on a surface, different coloured pencils. This exhibition was of drawings of these two quite different artists and the works were interspersed with each other. And now, um, Wisson's drawings, as I say, the, the white paper with lines sort of becoming figures. So they're sort of coming out of the, the whiteness of the paper and uh, uh, there's an imminence in the paper and they're, they're sort of uh, crystallising, something like that, out of the paper. Gleason's work was quite different. It's very influenced by uh, the Turner's, Tur James uh, uh, Turner, sorry, the Turner, you know, the English artist, uh, 19th century English artist, um, who sometimes painted landscapes of imagined cities and there's a, a glowing light in the distance and the ideal city is in the foreground with um, classical buildings and water and boats and all this sort of stuff. Well, Gleason does a variant of that. He shows um, uh, sort of figures in our id, these strange biomorphic figures with flies' eyes stuck on. They're quite dark, but then there's water, and behind you see this light. Um, what's the, the point of this, and what's this got to do with freedom? Well, there are two types of freedom uh, two, or two ways to characterise freedom amidst others. One's called positive freedom and one's called negative freedom. Um, the negative freedom is freedom from restriction. So if you imagine somebody who's been chained up, you take the chains off, he's no longer in chains, so he's what we call negatively free. He's free to do something, but he may not be doing anything yet. Um, the other type of freedom is positive freedom, which is more a sense of uh, you're going out and creating something or doing something. It's um, freedom to to find the new. Um, now, these Gleason paintings, the last case of the dark biomorphic figures, there's this light, idealised light in the distance, and it's like we're caught in our id and can't get to the light uh, because of... Our, ourselves are stopping ourselves from getting to the light. So it's about, I thought when I saw this exhibition, this could be, you could describe it as being about this negative sense of freedom. Are you free from yourself? And surreal and sort of explores uh, discovering yourself in that way. Uh, whereas the Ken Wissons started with this pure white uh, and coming, forming out of the whiteness of these forms. That's a very positive freedom. <laughs> That all sounds a bit esoteric, but that's an example of the way I think when I look at art. Um, what's that got to do with my work? Well, I am interested in, in this concept of uh, freedom and works I've been doing since then. I've been trying to arrange these shapes and thinking about these two different types of freedom and putting the, the shapes on a surface, timber panels, and uh, starting to explore uh, how you can arrange triangles and lines and squares so that they, they have an inherent sense of either motion or desire to move or instability and how do you, how do you explore those two concepts? Um, that's, that's what keeps me going with the, the work. 
another issue that's important to me is when you make a type of art in different times in history, um, a, an interesting question is what are the conditions of the time and the place of the art that make these different types of art possible? Um, and if you look at 20th century history, um, Gleason lived and worked in Europe where, where going back decades, you know, and there was still the shadow of the Second World War. So whereas somebody working in Australia, we were largely uh, free from that. And Australia is a very open country where a couple hundred years ago there was this notion, uh, you know, of these white settlers coming into Australia, like in the West in America, and moving out and creating something new. Um, but, yeah, there are the sorts of things that interest me, not so much the, the political side, but the notion of uh, what it is to be as a human and how does art relate to that in in those sort of concepts. And uh, I think art can explore those sorts of concepts without using words. I, some of what I've said doesn't relate directly to my own work, but it, it relates directly to my thought processes. And yeah. it's how we think that it is driving what we're, we're the, the art we make. Um, and that's why I've talked about those things, because they're, they're the, the influences on me, if you'd like to put it that way.